Happy Easter. Now, y'all have to get a little bit more alive in that now. The early service was alive, and we just praise the Lord for what God has already done. And I want you to open your Bible with me to John chapter 11. John chapter 11. Well, amen, amen. Happy Easter. Anybody get any new clothes? One. I know we have more than that to got new clothes. All right. All right. Good looking crew here this morning. And my prayer is that God will bless you and God will speak to you. And you'll leave here knowing that you have worshipped the resurrected Christ. Amen. Let's stand together. Honor the Word of God. John chapter 11. Verse 25, the Bible says, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, though he may be dead, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. And then the question, hey, do you believe this? Amen. Hickory with church, do you believe this? Yes, Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the Word of God. Thank you that we can come together on this celebration day. Thank you, Lord, that we know that every Sunday for the believer is Easter. Every Sunday we come together. We come on the first day of the week and we, we lift up the risen Savior. And I pray that our Savior today will speak to every one of us here. Thank you for the Holy Spirit, all the influence, the power that He has. I pray, God, that the Spirit of God will move up and down these aisles and uh, in and out of these chairs, Lord, and touch people today because we know in a crowd like this, Lord, there may be people that are lost. And I pray today, God, they'll, they'll know when they leave here that they have been born again and they're on their way to heaven. Help us as believers to be excited about you, to be living for you, to be witnessing for you. Thank you, Lord, that uh, you are so alive in us. And I pray the world will see Jesus in us. So bless this service. Thank you, Lord, for what already you have done. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> there was a missionary who went to some of the islands of Japan and on the island, he found a massive grave, and this is what he was told. This right here is a burial place for Christians. As he read the marker on the grave, he found out that there were 11,000 heads taken from the bodies of believers and buried in that place. The date of this is 1637, the same year the, the Japanese government ordered all Christians exterminated. I've always wondered what would happen if it came in our time that they would say, we want the Christians to be done away with. There are people today that are against all believers. You know that. We find that on television. We find that on the news. People do not like Christians. And I'm glad that we are brave enough, if that's a good word, to say we belong to Jesus and nobody can change that and we will not bend on that. We will not compromise on that. But the date was 1637. He was told about the heads in one place and he said all the bodies are put in another place to frustrate and confuse the Christians in their hope of the resurrections. Feeling if there was ever a resurrection, God would not be able to figure out what head went with what body, if you can imagine. And that just shows you the ignorance and the foolishness of other people. The resurrection of Jesus, you know what it guarantees? It guarantees the resurrection of every Christian, no matter what may happen to our body. And we get questions all the time. What if somebody dies at sea or in the ocean? What if they cannot find their body or their bodies has done, been done away with because they've been dead for so long? And that does not matter to our Heavenly Father because the God who made us can remake us. 
He has that much power. So today is a special day. We call it Easter. It is a time when people dress up. It is a time when people think about the, the Easter egg, Easter eggs and the bunny and, and all kinds of things like that. And I want to tell you, from my opinion, that's okay. It's okay for children to have a good time. But today is for the Christian a, a day of awakening. It is a day to know that the Jesus that we serve is not dead, but he is more alive today than he ever has been. And he's always been alive, hasn't he? People wonder what happened to Jesus in those three days after he was crucified. I'll tell you, my friend, he did not lay in the grave. He is alive, and we don't have time to go into that this morning, but we just need to celebrate the risen Jesus. Three points to the message. First of all, very simple. I want us to look before the resurrection. What actually happened before the resurrection? Because, friend, if, if we don't have a before the resurrection, then the gospel message is not complete. Jesus was baptized, the Bible says, by John the Baptist in the Jordan River. And I personally believe that every person who professes to know Christ needs to be immersed, be, be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. After that, the Bible says he went out in the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And there are three major temptations listed in the Bible. But in all reality, there were several temptations. But Jesus won every single one of those, even though Satan tried to to try to win and get him to bow down to him. I, I see the ministry of Jesus beginning, and I see as Jesus was on this earth, he taught the Scripture with a whole lot of authority. In fact, more authority than it, they had ever seen before. He healed the sick. In fact, he banished disease from Palestine when he was there. Friend, one of these days we'll be in heaven, and there will not be any disease. You do know that, don't you? We're going to be going to a place where, oh, hallelujah, friend. There's not going to be anything that we know of on this earth that will make us sick. Because one day we'll have a glorified body made just like the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and I love what Jesus did. He had, he had a meal with the disciples. And that, you know, we're going to get to eat and we're going to be able to do most, so much things. Some people think we're going to be on a cloud and we're just going to play a harp. And I mean, I can't think of anything more of a drag than that, friend. We're going to enjoy the Lord Jesus Christ, Amen. and we're going to be in heaven, and, and God's going to have us things to do, and we're going to serve Him, and it's just going to be open up for all eternity, and we're going to be able to go in and out of the city, and every time we go in and out of the city, we're going to be able to see those, those gates of pearl, realizing that it was only by the blood of Jesus that we get to be there. Jesus had so much compassion for people, and I think of his life and how much he loved individuals. And he took time and he stopped and he listened to their problems. And, you know, many of those he healed right there on the spot. And, and he's, still, he's still here with us today and he has so much compassion. But back then there were some religious leaders, religious, quote, folks, that all they wanted to do was try to get rid of Jesus you know why Jesus came, don't you? He came to save us from our sins. You're looking at a sinner right here saved by grace. You know, in my teenage years, I accepted the Lord as my Savior, and I've never looked back. But he not only came for me, but he came for every individual on the face of the earth. It does not matter the color of their skin or the religion they belong to, friend. There's only one way to heaven, and that's through Jesus and he came for everybody. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Huh. If you're not a Christian this morning, he wants to save you. And he wants to make you one of his children. You may have thought you're just coming to church on Easter. And by the way, I don't mean to be ugly, but I see some people on Easter. I don't see him till next Easter, so if you're here today, I want to tell you Merry Christmas. <laughs> I'd love to see you a whole lot more. I don't know where that came from. That just came out. Later, Jesus had the, the last supper with the disciples. You remember that? 
they were all leaning around the table and there was Jesus and, and Judas was at the table and hey, Jesus knew all along. And Judas left and did what he needed to do in his betraying experience. And, and you know, he, he washed the feet of the disciples. And that is amazing to me. And then they come and they arrest him. And they flog him. They beat him. Oh, my goodness, how they beat him, my friend. They made him carry the cross to Calvary. And oh, I, listen, I'm so thankful. I am thankful for that black fellow that came and picked up the cross. And help Jesus carry it to Calvary. I'm thankful. Soldiers took the big spike nails and put them in his wrist right here and in his feet. And there he hung that day. And he hung that day until he said, it is finished. Do you know what that means, friend, that it is finished? To tell us that it is finished. Because it is finished, he is bought and paid for our salvation. There's nothing we can do to be saved except repent and believe in Jesus will save us. How wonderful that is. I see the women and the children, they're crying. Some men are crying. Many were there and felt bad about what they saw. But, you know, if we'd have been there and saw all that they did to Jesus, we'd have felt bad. But there were many that day that did not believe in him and then still give their life to him. One man said, if you are the son of God, hey, come on down. Save yourself and save us. I've always thought in mind that mind the very first time I read that, oh, listen, he could have come down. You're talking about a man's man. You're not talking about a wimp here. You're talking about the very son of God, and he is the man's man. All he had to do was call the legion of angels. He would have come, and he could have wiped everybody out. Others came by that day and they saw him on the cross and they beat their chest. They went home and you know what happened? It passed. Like many people today that come to our church and come to churches across America and the world, they'll come and they'll feel bad about the message, but listen, they'll go out and eat after church and all that stuff will pass. It'll be business as usual for our life from Monday to Saturday without any change. Friend, when Jesus saves you, he changes you. That's the resurrected Christ that I'm talking about. Mm. This morning you may be under conviction, but you may leave here not saved, and you'll go home and have your little festivities with your family or whomever, and you will eat, and maybe it will pass, and that's sad. You know, Jesus died that day, didn't he? And the Bible says there were two criminals up there with him, one on each side of him. And the Jews had a law back then that a Jew could not stay on the cross all night long. They had to come down before the evening was over. And the Jews would take the dead body. They would wash the body. They would straighten out the body. And they would try, take strips of, of uh, cloth called swaddling and wrap up the individual. Does that sound familiar? It sort of sounds like Christmas. He was wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a manger. And here he is wrapped in swaddling clothes. And he is at his death. Friend, they wrapped him up like a mummy. They put him in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. And several men came to roll back that very heavy stone. One commentator said it, it almost weighed one, one ton. Can you imagine? And they would seal the tomb. And so Jesus Christ died, and he died for you and me. He died for you. He died for me. He died for you, my friend. And he died for me and the sins of the entire world. That is before the resurrection. I want you to notice the resurrection with me. Do you know that every Sunday is resurrection day? You do know that. And I told them earlier, and I want to tell you again, that we can't think about the resurrection without thinking about the women because you know what? They were there at the cross. They were there. They were there at the burial, and they're back again on the morning of the third day. They're always there. The women are there. Thank you, women, for what you do in our churches. Who are they, you say? Matthew 28, verse 1 says, Then came Mary Magdalene. Oh, my friend, she was saved. She was delivered from the way she lived, you remember? And the other married to see the grave. And there are others marked 
adds Salome, the mother of James and John. Luke adds Joanna. And Matthew 20, and then the, that's the wife of Cusa. That doesn't mean anything to you. Matthew 28 and verse 2. Go to Matthew with me very quickly, please. Matthew chapter 28 and verse 2 in chapter number 2. Wait a minute, I'm in the wrong chapter. Matthew 28 and verse 2. The Bible says, look at it, and behold. Now, behold is a shock word. In other words, something happened right here. Verse 2, there was a great earthquake. This is the second earthquake in three days, and that means that God is moving. Friend, do you understand how powerful God is? Do you understand that God the Father has the authority and the power to give you life, to bring you into this world, but he also has the power to take you out? And our days are numbered, aren't they? The angel, the Bible says in Matthew, an angel descended from heaven, and that's what caused the earthquake. The angel landed on the tomb. The tomb, the, the stone rolled out of the way. Some say, to let the Lord out, and I was telling him earlier, Brother John, that we have our D group, and we, we post on there, and the other night, he posted something about, you know what, that the Lord was already gone. A great reminder, he was already gone, friend. Hey, the angel landed. It was rolled away. The stone was to let the women in, and we already know that. Look at verse 4 in chapter 28. And the guards shook with fear of him because they were like dead men. The earthquake and the, the guards, the soldiers, the earthquake stopped, but they didn't. They kept shaking. They're still experienced in a personal earthquake. They became as dead men. And, I, you know, the, the commentaries tell us that it's sort of like a temporary coma. And verse 5, I love this. The angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He said, Stop being afraid. Friend, I would tell you right here today, on this day and this year, do not be afraid. The world, y'all, is going to get worse and worse and worse. Things are not going to get better before Jesus comes, so let's cheer up. Don't be afraid of what's happening around the world because God has everything under his hands and he is in control. Amen. Amen. Verse 6, he is not here. The Greek said he was raised. And then what an announcement, Jesus is alive. Notice the command by the angel in verse 7 of chapter 28 of Matthew. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And indeed, he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. Now, listen, friend. The disciples are not there. In my flesh, I would have said, I'm not going to tell those knuckleheads anything. They weren't here, so they can just miss out. But that's not the way that Jesus Christ operates, is it? Oh, listen, Jesus loves us. He loves you and me just like we are. He has the abundance of love, agape love for you and me. Now look at the joy in verse 8. They went out quickly. They did what the Lord said from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples' word. They had great joy. Why? Because they had experienced something there from the angel. Can you imagine them running away and saying the thrill that it, listen, that it might be true. That it might be true. And they were going to meet him in Galilee. In John chapter 20, all the gospels talk about the resurrection of Jesus. John and Peter run to the tomb and Peter will blast into the tomb because he's faster than John. John believed immediately. I wished I was like that, don't you? Peter had a hundred questions he wanted to ask, and that sounds like a lot of us. They left, but guess who did not leave? 
the woman Mary. Mary was so full of sorrow. She Listen, she did not even realize that she was talking to two angels. Let me go back to the book of John chapter 20. Let me, let me get over there real quick. I'll get there, Brother Gary Lynch. Just hang on with me. <laughs> John chapter 20. John and Peter run to the tomb, and we've said that. Look, at in, in verse 14 of chapter 20, the Bible tells us, Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know what it was, that it was Jesus. What a verse. Verse 15, he said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She's supposing him to be the what? Gardener said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. And he said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say, teacher. Do you understand what happened right here? She was the very first one to see the resurrected Christ. Matthew 28 and 9. Find it. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them saying, Rejoice. They came and held him by the feet, and they, they worshipped him. Friend, they worshipped him. And that's what God wants on this Easter Sunday for us to worship. The empty tomb, you know, that's wonderful. That's fantastic. That said something to us. The grave clothes over here, that said something. The unconscious soldiers, that said something. The angels, well, that said a lot. But this was it. They touched him they held him by the feet. And may I repeat this that I've said before. It was a real, physical, bodily resurrection. There was a battle that day. It was between death <laughs> and Christ. Guess who won? Christ won and death lost. One day you're going to die. Death. End. Period. But that's not the end of you as a believer. You're going to live on because over 2,000 years ago, Jesus conquered death. There was a battle. He conquered death that we may not have to stay there, that our body and our soul, our soul and our spirit, our body will go back there to heaven, soul and spirit with the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know what it means this morning that Jesus conquered death? It means to die is to only begin a new life. The grave is not the ending. And boy, I say hallelujah, the grave is not the ending. It's only the beginning. The grave is our entrance into heaven because he lives. Before the resurrection, the resurrection, after the resurrection. And the question is, did Jesus appear to some people in Jerusalem before the meeting in Galilee, and of course the answer is, yes, he did. He appeared to Mary Magdalene because of her devotion, my friend, because of her commitment and her faithfulness and her love, because she stayed at the grave, and later on he would appear individually to Peter. Luke chapter 24 will tell us that. After that, he appears to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Then on this Sunday night, the disciples were gathered in the upper room, and he appears to them, and I have to tell you this, at that occasion, there were two that were not there, and it was Thomas and Judas, and we know where Judas was. Eight days later, John 20 says, he appeared again in the upper room. This time, Thomas was there. Now we have the great appearing in Galilee. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul writes about it. After that, he was seen of about 500 people at one time. Wow. After that, he appeared to the apostles before the ascension. And let's just say double wow. I was telling him in the first service, and uh, 
I can't turn the computer on, and I, I do certain things with the computer, and I try to help, it tries to help me, and I try to avoid it, but it helps me a lot of times. And I wanted to know the population of the world. And I, I, I opened it up, and, and it was amazing to me if you've ever done that because it will tell you the population of the world right now. And on the very right side, it will, it will be turning over all the time, the people that are being born. At the bottom, it was telling you all the people that were dying I found out when I was watching, I had to write something down quick because it was turning so fast. So 8,026,940,000 people the other day were walking around on the planet Earth. And I want you to know those without Jesus, of all those billions of people, friend, without Jesus, they go to hell. But guess what? They don't have to. The Bible says our life is so short, and I'll guarantee you it is. I mean, our life is short. We change. <laughs> Have you ever looked at your high school picture and you look in the mirror? I mean, folks, think about it. You're old or you're getting old. There's such a drastic change when you have a class reunion after 25 years. Some people don't even look like themselves. Listen, we're all dying. Life is like a vapor. It's here today and gone tomorrow. Hebrews 9 says, It is appointed unto man once to die, and after that the judgment. It is appointed to each one of us. If I live long enough and you want me to, I'll do your funeral. <laughs> I mean, the Bible says, It is appointed unto man once to die, and after that the judgment. Statistics tell us that three people die every second. 180 people die every minute. 11,000 people die every hour. 260,000 people die every day. And 95 million people around the world die every single year. And 2 Samuel 20 says, Surely as the Lord lives and as you live, there is only one step between me and death. There's only one step. There's only one heartbeat. In our juggler vein, there's only one heartbeat between you and death and me and death. February 27, 1991, Desert Storm, Ruth Dillo received a message from the Pentagon that no parent wants to receive. Her son had stepped on a mine, and he had died. This is what she said. I cannot begin to describe my grief. It was more than I could bear. All I could do for three days was cry and mourn and cry and mourn. Then after the third day, the phone rang. The voice on the other line said, Mama, it's me. I'm alive. Can you imagine? Ruth Della said she first of all could not believe it, but then she recognized his voice, and she couldn't help all of her emotions because her son, who she thought had died, was alive. She said, I laughed and I cried, and I felt like doing cartwheels because I thought he was dead, but he was alive. Can you imagine that, friend? That's the way all the disciples felt three days after they found out Jesus was alive. They know the feeling that Ruth had about her son. In the Old Testament, Job asked the question, if a man dies, shall he live again? What kind of question is that? That's a great question. Not only in the past, history but also today and it'll keep being asked because a lot of people don't believe there's going to be anything to happen to you after you die a lot of people say well you better live it up right now because what you have right now is it and when you're gone you're gone many people will say well preacher i hope so i hope there's going to be life after death Others have tried to explain it away. Many, many people have denied it, and there are many American people today uh, and around the world that are trying to deny it even on this day that we're here. Have you learned that people don't like Christians? They really hate Christians today. 
We've had examples of that here in the last couple of weeks where children were killed and three adults were killed because they, I believe it's just a, a battle against good and evil in our world. So what do you think right now, church? What do you think now? If a person dies, will they live again? I love the story in John 11 when Jesus went to the funeral of his friend Lazarus. He went there and he was shedding some tears and Jesus told Martha, your brother will rise again. I mean, that was good news. She said, I know he'll rise again at the resurrection of the last day. Jesus said, hey, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. <laughs> hey, Martha, when I walked in, the resurrection walked in. <laughs> hey, when I, and when I walked in, Martha, the resurrection walked in. What powerful words, the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the whole Christian doctrine that we're talking about today stands or falls on the reality of the resurrection of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ. I think about discoveries we've had in our country, what we learned in history and in geography. I believe the greatest discovery that has ever been made was when two women went to a tomb on Sunday morning and discovered absolutely nothing. Nobody was in the tomb, were they? There were grave clothes. They tell us a napkin and 75 pounds of spices. Let me go back to John. John chapter 20. I want to read this to you. John chapter 20 and verse 6. The Bible says, Simon Peter came following him, and he went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloths lying there. And look here. The handkerchief that had been around his head, not laying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Is that important? I guarantee you. The napkin that was placed over the face of Jesus was not just thrown in there like the grave clothes. The napkin was neatly folded and placed in a place all by itself. Hebrew tradition tells us this. When the servant set the table for the master, for the master to have the meal, he wanted it to be perfect. He wanted it to be just like the master wanted it. The servant would then wait just out of sight over here, not say anything, but he had waited until his master finished the meal. The servant would not dare touch the table until the master was finished. And if the master was finished with his meal, you know what he would do? He'd take his napkin and he'd wipe off his mouth, wipe off his face and his hands, and he'd, and he'd ball it up and he'd just toss it over there on the table. The servant would then know that it's time to clear the table. But if the master got up from the table, folded his napkin, and laid it perfectly folded beside his plate, the servant would not touch the table because he know, knew the folded napkin meant, <laughs> I'm not finished yet. The folded napkin meant I'm coming back. Listen, four of the greatest words anywhere found in the Bible is in Matthew 28 and verse 6. He is not here. Inside that tomb today was a folded napkin in a place all by itself. You know what Jesus Christ is saying to all of his children today? I'm coming back. I'm coming back. I think about the message of Easter. You know, we have Easter every year. Everybody, some people get new clothes. Anybody get new clothes? A lot of children get new clothes. And we have the Easter eggs and we have the chocolate bunnies and all that good stuff. And, and children ought to have fun. I want you to know that. They ought to have fun. And we have Easter on a special Sunday every year. And today you may say, 
Brother Eddie, I believe all that you are saying. I mean, I believe every single bit of what you're saying. And then I would say to you, that's wonderful, but there needs to be a response from you. In other words, coming to church on Easter won't get you to heaven, will it? The Bible says you must repent or turn from your sin. The Bible says that you must give your life from that life over to a life of newness with Jesus Christ. And then by faith you believe that all that Jesus did in his birth, his life, his death, and his resurrection. And we don't want to leave out the bell in the ascension. That's all part of it. But that's something that by faith we must believe and then you have to invite him personally to come into your life and save you. Friend, I would not be walking on this planet right now lost and on my way to hell. I know today that if I, to, if I today die, well, hallelujah, girls. If we are to die today, I mean, God has a plan for your life and mine. Does he not? We need to know that we're saved, don't we? We need to know that we're on our way to heaven. You know what awaits us in heaven? We get to be with Jesus. And we get to be with our loved ones and friends who've gone on before us. Does that not excite you? If what we have right here is all there is, wouldn't that be a drag? Romans chapter 10, if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. When it's all over and done with, my friend, your decision with the man called Jesus is all that matters. That's all that matters. You can be churchy all your life and die in your sins and go to hell. But you can be born again by the blood of Jesus and enjoy your life along the way. Not a perfect life. A hard life sometimes. But you know when you leave this world, you will be home in heaven with the Lord. Did the resurrection happen? I guarantee you it did. History proves it. All kind of things that has happened in our in our. In our time before us, it proves that the resurrection actually did happen. And today I stake my eternity on what this book says. If you need to be born again, if you need to be saved, it doesn't matter if you're a member of this church or any other church. If you've never given your life to Jesus, friend, this is the day you need to do that. Because only Jesus will get you there. Because He is the only way. Will you come today and give your life to Him? Christian, where's your joy today? If you're really born again and Jesus is not the joy of your life, you need to just get right with Him. Just give it back to Him the way it should be. God's speaking to some people to come join our church. It'd be a good day to do it on Easter. Don't you think? Let's stand together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the Word of God. We stand on the Word of God and we believe it. And I pray, dear God, that our church will be a shining light. And I pray the moving of the Holy Spirit will touch our lives today. This is not just something we do during the week or once a year. Lord, this is a reality that changes our life. And I pray on this day, that if there's one person lost right here, I pray they will come down the aisle and be saved before it's an everlasting too late. And Lord, revive the Christians. Please send revival, Lord. Please heal our land. Bless this invitation. In your name. Amen.